Welcome everybody. This is the Thursday evening Viper Trading Webinar. If you're here to learn about trading the futures markets using the Viper tools, you are in the right place. First, we've got to stock, uh, knock out our standard disclaimer. We can get straight away over to some charts and looking at trades, which is why, of course, everybody's here tonight. All communications from Viper Trading Systems are for educational purposes only. Futures and Forex trading does involve risk, and there is a risk of loss. Nothing contained in this webinar. Other webinars, including the live trading room, are to be construed as investment or trading advice. And, of course, everybody here does know that you do trade at your own sole discretion. All right, let me get over to uh, screen one where I have all the charts. And I'm going to ask a couple of questions. Tonight's topic is uh, mid-band trades, the good, the bad, and the ugly. But I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to mix it up a little bit um, with some questions and comments first before we get into uh, some tr uh, actual trade setups. So if we were to think about some of the most important things that for us to, uh, to do and to know in terms of our success in trading futures, what, what, what would be what would be the top if you were to list one or two? I got this funky mouse thing here. I don't know what happened to my mouse. Get all messed up today. Go ahead. Let's just type in here. What what would be what would be number one? What would be number two? Let's just list two. I know there's a lot of different things that are important when you're considering trading, but what would be what would be right right at or near the top? Hmm. What would be at or near the top? Just got a breakout on NASDAQ here. What's important? What do we need to know when we are trading futures markets? I'm going to attribute a little bit of this to a Skype conversation I had, or it was a phone call actually today. What's important? What is the most important? What is the top two out of everything? All the myriad of things you could know about trading futures, what would be number one and number two, in your opinion? Uh, let's see here. Context. I don't know if that's a question or what that is there, James. Hey, Jim. Jim S. Proper entry and stops. Trading a don't care size, okay, not sure what that is. Controlling your losses is important. Stopping when you reach your goal, yes. Being able to call tops and bottoms of range bound activity, identifying good mid-man trades. Brad, I'm gonna, I'm gonna come back to that one. I'm gonna come back to Brad's. Risk management, yep, that's up there. Roger, I'm gonna come back to yours too, waiting for a good entry. Entries from David D, risk management. Yep. Knowing how deep their tracement's going to be. That's part of it. Richard, you of all people should know what this is. Not what, what, Two of you tonight came close to saying it. I would go back in here and, and I'll tell you the two that were close and, and nobody else said it. Uh trade where was it Roger said and this is close this is very very close I'm going to give him sort of a, a, a an a minus B plus on it knowing your instrument and the proper entries and then there was another one trading the personality where was that the personality of the market that you are trading. That's getting close. All right. I would put it number one, above entries, above risk management, above targets and stops, above all of that is trading the right instrument. How many of you tried to trade gold today at the oil inventory? I mean, uh, oh, I'm sorry, oil. How many of you tried, tried to trade crude oil? at the oil inventory numbers? That's a two-part question. Did you try to trade it, and how did you do? Did you trade it? How did you do? 
No. Some no's. So here's where I'm going with this. Here's where I'm going with this. You could be the best mid-band trader on the planet Earth. You could know mid-band trades like the back of your hand. But if you trade an instrument that doesn't respect support and resistance, you're going to get what? whack a mold and all beat up. Instrument selection is the key to your success. You can do all the training. You can watch all the videos. I could show you 27 trades till Sunday. And if you pick the wrong instrument to trade, you guess what? You're going to lose money. I've been saying that for eight years now, and it still amazes me how nobody listens to it. <laughs> I don't mean to be a jerk or anything. You know, I don't want to say nobody uh, because, you know, I, I would say that maybe a better way to put it is a very small percentage of people actually listen to that. And I've said tons of times that that's number one importance. See, crude oil, it's first of all, it's twice the risk of the other $5 instruments, right? Here's inventory right here. Look at that massive shotgun. This is inventory right here. So before inventory, crude didn't really do much of anything, right? It just, just chopped around a little bit. And then we get the inventory numbers, and then it takes off like a little rocket bird. And then it starts to really shoot around all over the place. You know, it's just shooting all over the place here. So, yeah, I mean, there were a couple of trade setups here. Right before we closed the room, we had a little pullback. We got a long trade here, long trade here. And you could have made some money, no question about it. And then it went into some chop. Yeah, you've got to you've got to pick an instrument that suits your trading style and personality. I would put oil into the more advanced category. If you really know your entries and you can handle deep retracements, here's a good example right here. Let's look, let's just peel a couple of these off right here. We'll pretend we're looking at this in real time. I don't know what in the dealio with my cursor is here, but here's a little mid band. You thought it was going to bounce, and of course it didn't. It went all the way out to Phantom here. Then it came back up, and it looked like it was going to take off, and it didn't. Came back, didn't check this. Now you're in this funky melange here. Really, the only decent trade you had set up was over here, right after the inventory numbers. You got this nice shot up, but that all happened in about two minutes. So really, you were kind of left with this. And then if you waited till later in the morning, like around 9.30 or 10, finally it resolved itself and the market headed down because the trend on oil is actually down right now. They had a huge drawdown. If you looked into the oil numbers, the way it worked was this, is that there was a huge drawdown in gas and oil inventory. It was 6.5 versus 2.3 projected. So that's an, that's an incredi incredibly bullish number, three times the drawdown. But the production went up. And the trend on oil is down. So all this was was food for the bears. Okay, All this run up here, that was just food for the bears. The bears came in and hammered this thing. Look at it. Here's uh, 9.30. So you're about an hour and a half after the, after the market, and you got this beautiful short trade. And it never looked back. I mean, it just, it just, it's still tanking right now. Here was a rollover right here. But I would put... It, you know, if you consider yourself, I, you know, you got to sort of think about where you're at in your trading development, right? Um, you know, from a from a scale of one to ten, one being, let, let's do a, just a two second pop quiz for for everybody here, and be honest with yourself and honest with the team. If you would scale yourself now from one being a very beginner and ten being an expert. Where would you put yourself on the scale of, of uh, uh, trading uh, skill sets right now? Are you somewhere in the middle, like a five or a six maybe? Or are you a four? Where are you in your development? I mean that collectively for the team. Everybody in here, just type in a number. Where, where are you? From one beginner to ten expert. Everybody's some everybody's somewhere from one to ten. I mean, just be honest with yourself, right? Where where are you? Where are you right now? Are you towards the upper end? Would you consider yourself a seven, eight, or nine, or even a ten? Or are you more skewed towards the beginner sort of intermediate stage, which would be kind of like your two, three, four, five? Wow, interesting. Couple of sixes, a seven, two sevens, a five, quite a few fives. Okay. So now, if you're scaling yourself as a five, what you're essentially saying about your, your trading skill set as of this moment in time is that 
is that you're sort of in the middle, right? You're not a beginner, and you're still learning some some skill sets, which is fair. And you're working your ways up to way to more the expert level, which takes time, more screen time, more trading, etc. So I would say that trading crude oil would be you would need to be up near the expert level to trade crude oil. I, I would say probably a six, seven, eight or higher is where I would put crude oil for two reasons. First of all, the vo the type of volatility that crude has, it just is not um, you know, uh, conducive to beginner to any intermediate traders. It just isn't. And with $10 a tick, you know, a couple of 10, you know, you put a contract or two on and you take a 10, 12 tick pop. I mean, you could be down 300 bucks in a heartbeat on oil. And if you traded oil and lost money, you know what I'm talking about. So now for those of you that are learning, what are we going to do with oil? Is this, is this an instrument that should even be on your screen at all? Let me just put it a different way. Is this an instrument that should even be on your screen that you're looking at? Probably not. So what are you going to do? You're going to take it off. Because here's what happens, and I'm just the last thing I'm going to say about this, and I, and I, and I don't want to I don't want to keep beating a dead horse here, but I want to make a point. Look. We all have so much attention span available to us, right? Some more than others. Some some folks have the TV on, their dog's sitting next to them, they got a cup of coffee, maybe they're eating breakfast. You know, you've got maybe three or four charts up, you got oil, maybe you're looking at gold, I don't know, maybe NASDAQ and something else. And so what happens is each one of these things are distractions, okay? They just are. And you can only focus on so many things. The human can only focus on so many, too, so many things. So here's what I'm saying. Let's go back to what we had before. Stand by. I can never say this enough. That's why I keep saying it, because it's so important. And, uh, you know, you've heard me say it. For those of you veterans here that have been around a while, you've heard me say this until I'm blue in the face, right? But it makes a big difference. I mean, if you're if you're uh, on a free trial, if you're learning, if you're in that intermediate stage, this is all very applicable to you. Let's go back here to this setup right here. Now, in the room, this is what you see. That's a lot of information going on right there, right? And so, let's say you're trying to track a Nasdaq trade, and you hear some kind of call call on gold. Well, next thing you know, you turn to gold. And then there's something comes up on YM. YM is a mid-band bounce, but but by the time you look over here, it's already bounced and it's up here. And now you're kind of chasing it, right? And then somebody says something about crude, and you, meanwhile the Nasdaq trade over here that you wanted has already taken off, and you completely missed that because you're not focused on it. And the Russell's chopping around, so you think there's something here, and you're kind of looking at that one. There's too many distractions here. You have to simplify your life. Most of you, in all due respect, should probably not be looking at any more than one or two charts. Never more than three. Absolutely not more than three. And the third one should be a tertiary one tucked in a corner somewhere. What I mean by that is not your primary focus. You should pick one or two and be focused on it. Right now, right now, uh, or at this particular point in time, one you might want to consider is YM. YM is a $5 a tick instrument. It doesn't move a lot. It's kind of slow. But in the beginning, what are you trying to do? Are you trying to make money? In the beginning stages and intermediate stages of your trading career, are you trying to make money? Is that your central focus? You're trying to make as much money as you can every morning, right? You're trying to make money. Is that the most important thing? What? Well, aside from instrument selection, what else? You, well, you talked about targets, stop management, risk management. Trade entries. Most of you typed this in. That was number, I put that a very close number two to instrument selection. Trade entries. Let's face it, if you can't get the trade entry correct, the rest of it doesn't matter. Right? The rest of it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. If you can't get the methodology of entry down, then it doesn't matter where your targets and stops are because you've got a crappy entry. So what I'm trying to suggest to you is this, is if you cut your teeth on a smaller, slower moving instrument to allow yourself the ability to see moves and get in without getting hurt, 
you will advance your skill sets to a level, a level where you can take something more on. But if you never get the first part down, you're not going to get to that next stage. So let's take a look at YM real quick here this morning. You can see here in the pre-market session, we were in the midst of a sell-off. Now, this is the whole morning right here. Look, here's Midnight Pacific. I'm here in California. So this is this morning on Weimer. Of course, you can see in the, um, uh, in the uh, European session, you had a little bit of a sell-off here. Came up, had a little mid-band trade. You could call this a deep retracement, although the background did turn green. 6.30 open of the equity markets in the U.S. was right here. Right? And then around 6.38, we had a mid-band set up right here. Now, this particular one wasn't very good. Yeah, that's true, Brad P. I like that comment. You need to develop the skill sets to be consistent. That's right. Consistency is the key. Consistency is the key. It's absolutely the key. Consistency from day to day is what's going to give you long-term success. Because everything flows from consistency. So here's what, here, here, here's what you have in terms of focus. I'm just going to go ahead and summarize this real quick so we can get into trades. By far, I would say number one would be instrument selection, without question. You don't trade the right instrument, it doesn't matter. The rest of it doesn't matter. And that comes down to only having one or two charts to focus. You got to focus, right? Number two, entries. Entries, entries. I'm just going to put it in three times so it's clear. Everything else flows from that. And this, this, is, this is what uh, Brad and some other comments that are coming in are so true. Because what flows out of entries is what? Confidence. If you're not confident in what you're doing, how is the entry thing going to be working out for you? Probably not too good. You're going to be gun shy and you're going to be late all the time, right? I'd say that's the top three right there, building your confidence. And then, of course, everything else flows from there, risk management, targets, stops, et cetera, all that sort of stuff. Instrument selection, you've got to get that right. Focus on the entries in the beginning. It doesn't matter. Look, if you, if you get a good entry and you can get up into that 67, 70, 75, 80-plus percent success rate, even if you're scalping two or three ticks, it's huge because now you're seeing the entries. The entries are a transferable skill between other instruments, right? In other words, if you cut your teeth on YM and really sort of get this Weimer down, eventually you could put two or three contracts, maybe five or ten, and start making good money on it, and then you start to branch out. And you say, well, you know what? I'm, my confidence level is high. My success win rate on entry is pretty high. I'm, re I'm ready to go take a look at NASDAQ. I'm going to go take a look at the Russell. You know what? I'm going to put a gold chart up and keep an eye on it today. Everybody understand that? I mean, if you want to really get focused on your success, I would focus on these three right now in the in the short term. All right, enough about that. Let's move on. Now, shortly after the market opened, you had to be pretty quick on the draw here. You did have a decent mid-band box right here. Now, I'm going to use this as a definition for a good box. A good box is as follows. It's all about the size of the box, not necessarily the location of it. And by the way, for you that are new and visiting, what we're referring to when we say box is we have a tool, of course, called the Object Trader. Most of you know it. It's a panel right here that's a semi-automated trade, uh, semi trading tool. And one of, the, is, one of them is called a region box. There's several parts to the tool. And you know to use the, the hotkeys to put the box in draws the region and we engulf it and normally you know you let the box run out for some period of time a good box is generally under 10 ticks in size so when I say under 10 ticks in size I mean that you're looking at bars that are somewhat tightly packed here for instance the bottom was at 63 and here the top was at um, 70, 71. This is like a 7, 8 tick box. This is perfect. This is probably with a 4 range bar as almost as tight as you're going to get it. 
okay? And what you're looking for is the market to come and pause at the mid-band. This one's sitting actually right on the mid-band, so it's ideal. Now, in this case, you got a long fill right here. And you may or may not have got a scalpy out of it. Maybe you did, maybe you didn't. Came back in the box and then flipped. Now, look, I want to show you something here, and this is an important pattern to learn. Okay, this happens not all the time, but, but many times. Some traders might say something like this. Well, you know, Charles, I see this box. I see it came over here. I see it came back in the box. The long trade stopped out. It should have flipped and got short because in the first half an hour, do we have a directional bias or do we let markets go both ways? We let them go both ways, right? Thanks, Mark. I'll take a look at that. Mary, let me see here. Do you remember exactly? Uh, well, the blowing account thing, she's asking about what, 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 what turned it around for me when I was blowing up accounts. Getting out of trading stocks. <laughs> not trading stocks, not trading options, and getting out of Forex and trading the futures. That, that, that's what turned it around. And then, of course, developing the software with Gary um, that we're running here. See, back then, we didn't have any software like this. We didn't have bands. We didn't have range bars. We didn't have anything. You were trading minute bars on stocks, and it was terrible. Um, but this is a lot better. You know what instrument you're going to trade. You should going into the morning, right? It's not like you got to do a ton of research and see if tech's moving that day or what's gapped up and down and you're going to fill the gap. You don't have to deal with any of that stuff. You know, you should know what you're going to trade and you should know pretty much exactly how you're going to trade it, right? Anyway, back to this. Uh, this pattern happens a lot where you get a break of a support area and then it will come back up and check it like this. Now what I'm saying, here's, here's why I'm saying that, is that, you know, this all happened in about two, the span of about two to three minutes. Let's just look at this real quick. Okay, let's just look at the setup right here. Here's 633, here's 635, it came out of the box around 636, so you're about two, three minutes into this. There was, what I'm impressing upon you is that there was plenty of time to draw a box and take a trade here and let the box continue out. A lot of people or traders, you know, I see this sometimes, they'll come and they'll have a tiny little box and they'll let it expire. And they won't let it run out like another five, ten minutes. You should just let that box run out until you're done with it. Because many times you'll get the situation, it will come up or it'll come down and then it'll come right back into your box. It'll stop out that other trade and it'll flip and take you the other way. But if you didn't even have a box between this bar breaking at 638 and rolling over here, it was about a minute. Here's 639 over here. You had about a minute. A minute in trading is, is a long time, huh? I mean, compared to NASDAQ, if I went back and pulled up a NASDAQ chart, here, let's do that, just for the heck of it. I'm going to do that. Let's do that right now. I'm going to do that right now. We're going to look at 738 on NASDAQ right exactly at the same time that Weimer did that break. Here, let's get Weimer over here. Here's Weimer. This is the open to 639, so this is the first nine, this is actually the first 12 minutes on Wyoming. Let's get the NASI chart up here. Let's see what NASI was doing at that time. I'm telling you right now, it, it, what, what has happened is this, okay, and, and I don't, you know, I don't have any special vision into, you know, the big boys. I, you know, I, 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 I do have some connections in, before into Barclays, but particularly in the programming area, so I know something about that. But what's happened is that high-frequency trading has moved into NASDAQ. It just has. It just it, High-frequency trading is in NASDAQ right now. That's exactly what this is. That's, this, is, this is all computer algorithms running right in here. That's all what that is. It's all computer algorithms. All of it. I mean, there's a few discretionary traders trying to fight their way through it. It, it. Most of you, have you noticed over the past few days and the past few weeks, I haven't called hardly any NASDAQ trades? I used to trade NASDAQ all the time, every day, all morning. Remember? Anybody remember that? For years. When's the last time you heard me do a NASI call? A couple days ago? A couple, a couple, maybe one or two this morning? What, why do you think that is? Here. Here, let me show you. Let me show you right here. I'll show you. It's a bullet train. If you want a bullet train, and you want to get on a bullet train, trade NASDAQ. 
I trade uh, the Russell. I trade YM. Um, I keep an eye on crude and I keep an eye on gold, but most of my money is made on YM and Russell right now. They're a lot smoother. They're a lot calmer. They're kind of their old selves. And NASDAQ has been taken over by high frequency programs. That's, that's the bottom line. All right. Here's 630 right here. Okay. Here's 630 and here's 631. All these bars printed in one minute, right here. And here's 632. So you're two minutes into trading. Here's 633. Here's 633. 634. Here you're four minutes into the market, and all these bars have printed. All right. Let's go back over and let's look at so let's contrast this movement with Weimer. In fact, we're going to have to expand this chart just to show all the bars. Here's all the bars in the first four minutes on, on, uh, on NASI, and here's all the bars in the first four minutes on Weimer. Right here. All of these bars on printed on NASDAQ, and I have no idea how many. There might be 100 or more bars here. There's probably at least 50 or 60 bars. And here's that same time period on, on YM right here, this, this patch of bars right here. That's the same time period right there. Insane. It is insane. Has anybody tried to trade NASI lately? And how, and it's a two-part question, and how are you doing on it? It is just so fast. Those algos are, are pumping. It is high-frequency programs pushing the market around. I'm telling you, that's what it is. What happened is that they, for some reason, uh, you know, the big boys have decided to, to move into the futures markets. You know, a lot of the stock markets have been tapped out. They're not getting the volatility. Have you seen volatility in the equity markets? It's like a 20-year lows. They're seeking alpha. They got to find. They got to find. Pro, they got to make money. They got to turn their computer programs on something, and they've picked Nasdaq. Peter says I trade it, but I'm normally done by 9:40 every morning and switch into sim. Good. Lee says I've been trained to do it. I've been trying to scalp it for six ticks, and I've been doing lousy. Brian says I no longer look at it. I wish the room would get rid of it. <laughs> I stay out. I don't look at it. Algo wars for Mary, very selective. Now look, there are times when Nazi eventually calms down. We all know that, right? Okay, let's go on. Let's, let's con just real quick continue on here. Let's go over to our trade setup on Wyme. So you can look, I mean, I'm, you can just, I'm not going to do every minute, minute by minute, but all I'm trying to press upon you is this. Here is 636 right here. Here's 636. All these bars are printing in a minute. Here's 637. Here's 637. All those bars are printing in a minute. 638, 638, 639. All these bars printed in a minute right here. On Weimer, you're looking at this many bars. Here's a minute on Weimer would be something like this. That would be one minute on Weimer, right there. What is that? One, two, three, four bars. Four or five bars. That same minute over here would be this. Let's do 638. 638 starts here, and 639 is over here. That's a minute. That's a minute, two minutes on NASDAQ, and this is a minute on Weimer. Can everybody see the difference in volatility that we're talking about here? So, you know, if, if, if you, you've heard the responses from seasoned traders in here, and uh, what I'm trying to impress upon you, and I'm not, I, I am not saying to not trade NASDAQ. What I'm trying to impress upon you for somebody who's traded NASDAQ for years is that the trading personality of this instrument has changed dramatically due to the big boys running their scripts. There's algorithms running in here, and it's extremely difficult 
as a retail trader with our tools to compete against those algorithms. They're too fast. By the time you get filled in here, you get, and you're trying to get in and you get out, it's all the way back in your face. And you're trying to sort out what direction the thing's going, and it's whipping around. Here, here's 643, 644. What, what is this? Is this a mid-band trade? What is that? What is this right here? I don't know. I don't even look at it some mornings. I don't even look at it until after 7 o'clock. It's just it's a bullet train flying down the track at 100 miles an hour. I mean, even in here where you're trying to scalp it, you know, you get a rollover and it checks. By the time you get filled on a rollover trade here, let's do a hypothetical. Let's say you threw a box right here and you got lucky. Well, you did, probably didn't have time to draw a box in, in all honesty, but let's pretend you did. By the time you got filled, you're in down here. By the time it got down here and you're trying to get up, it's already back in your face a minute later and going higher. Are you trying to rebox this? I don't know. You can't even throw a ray on there. Yeah, it's insane. It's absolutely nuts. I, I, I would not recommend, uh, you know, until after 7 o'clock. Let's see what happened. I think because uh, we had some news at 7. No, nope, she was still whipping. There's 7. Here's the news right here. <laughs> this will be the last I'll show. I, wanna, I have some other things to show. I don't want to get all tied up on NASDAQ. Here's 659 right before the news. And then here's, well, actually 659 is right here. All right. Well, no, yeah, no, it's over here. There's 659 right before the news. And then here's 7 o'clock. Here's the news. And 701 is all the way over here. <laughs> I mean, come on. <laughs> you know, if you want if you want something where, where you had a grinding sieve and you want to take your money and just dump it in a big mixer that's going about 100 miles an hour to chop up your money into little tiny bits, this would be a picture of it in Wikipedia on how to do it right here, right there. 50 bars in two minutes. Let's go over and take a look at what Weimer did at that same time. Weimer had a nice little rollover short trade. Look, you had you had a here's 653. We'll come back. I'll, I'll circle back to this. I'm just going to show it just for now. Okay, I'll circle back to this to these trades and talk about them in more detail. I'll, I'm trying to do a contrast here right now. And then here's seven o'clock. It was a beautiful textbook. In fact, I remember calling this out in the room. Remember? I forget. It was 20. What did I say? Just under 30. Look for a roll under 30. Anybody remember that? At the time, it was coming down. Remember, I was short. I'm trying to think, and my stop was up around 30, remember? I said it's going to come back to the mid-band. Sure enough, at the news, there's 7 o'clock right there, 7.01. There, what'd you get? 7 to 7.01. You got maybe, I don't know, six bars? And this is what you got on NASDAQ in that same, same, same time frame. See how much more methodical is it is? See how much more easy to trade? How much easier it is to see the trade entry and get in and out of it? These trades that I'm showing you right here on YM are, are very nice, calm, methodical trades where an instrument is behaving itself and it's not being overrun by algorithms and scripts. They're bona fide, good, easy to take trades and you can put a couple of contracts on them and make very decent money. And that's all you're looking for right now, some confidence builders and to put a little coin in your trading account. If you want a recipe to get whack-a-mole and hand money to the market, then get in front of the freight train here. Actually, technically, technically, it's a bullet train. And you're going to be standing right on the tracks. But I die of boredom. I hear that all the time, Mary. I hear that all the time. It moves so slow I could fall to sleep. Well, here's the other thing. Look, there are other markets to look at. The, these, the ones in the room are not the only markets you could be trading. Everybody knows that, right? We have traders that join us from all over the world, all over Europe, Eastern, uh, Eastern Europe, Canada, you know, various parts, Sweden. I mean, I can't name all the countries we have traders from. Look at this instrument. There's 160 trading instruments. You could be, I know traders who look at currency pairs in the morning. You know, they're looking at 6E, they're looking at 6A, they're looking for movement on the dollar index, right? There's EMD. Let me see if I can get EMD to load without crashing. Stand by. EMD is a good proxy for the Russell. I'm going to pull the Russell up in just a second here. So here's what it comes down to. And, and I understand your comment, Mary, and I know a lot of you say the same thing. It, it, Weimer is a sleeper, no question about it. ES is even more of a sleeper than that. 
EMD can be a good proxy for um, the Russell. Let me put the Russell next to EMD. EMD is the mid-cap 400 uh, futures. Let's go back and look at this morning. It's not been overrun with algorithms. And it should look almost exactly like the Russell chart. They're very close. It's another. It's t uh, $10 a tick. Russell used to be $10 a tick, and now it's switched to 5 so it's half the risk that it used to be. And actually, I don't know, does anybody remember? Remember that we used to trade the Russell? Gary used to trade the Russell all the time, and it was $10 a tick. And it was wild. It was the woolly beast. Remember? Anybody remember that? Remember it used to be the Russell that was the wild one? Back in the old days? Yeah, here's the Russell over here. Now, you know, I, if I was to grade it from speed of market movement, I would grade it as follows with 10 being the fastest. I would put at the lowest end of volatility is ES. It is by far the slowest mover. It's 12.50 a tick. Let me get, let me try to compare the opens of these two. And you'll see how they're very similar. In fact, a lot of people think EMD is actually a little smoother uh, than the Russell, although it's very similar. Can you see how the charts are very similar at the open? First five, 10 minutes. In terms of volatility, I would rank it as follows. If you're looking for, it, it, you know, it, it's, it's kind of like how much heart medicine, blood pressure medicine have you taken for that day, right? At the lowest end of volatility by far is ES. No question about it. After that, I would put, and this is, this is, this is a score from low to high, low volatility, meaning low, slow movers. If you like low volatility slow, slash uh, uh, low volatility, What am I doing here? I'm just going to put low volatility slash slower moving instruments. By far, ES is at the lowest of the totem pole. I would put Weimer next. I would put uh, EMD next. I would put TF next. And then at the very, very top, highest volatility would be NQ. In that order, from low to high this being high, the maximum, highest volatility, fastest moving. Yeah, I think it uh, used to be you needed a separate data feed for the Russell, but as I understand it, and I believe you're correct, Peter W., that if you have a CME data feed, which of course everybody does, everybody has a CME data feed from your broker, uh, the Russell will start coming through on the CME data feed. July 10th. Is it July? Yeah, July 10th. Is that next Tuesday or Monday? Yeah, Monday. Monday you'll start getting the Russell on, so you don't have to pay that separate fee for ICE, the 117 a month. So what I'm trying to impress upon you is this, is that if, you, if, if you're starting to roll, rule out NASDAQ as a trading instrument due to this, this algo problem, then these are the instruments you should go start taking a look at. You should start looking at the Russell. You should bring up the EMD and take a look at it. You can look at Weimer, and some of you might want to look at ES. I think ES and Weimer tend to have the uh, um, smoothest, uh, uh, tr most tradable boxes. If you like region boxes at or near the mid-man, I would put these two higher in ranking due to this, the low volatility and the slower movement. They tend to pause at the mid-band a little better, a little more. EMD would be next up the totem pole, and then the Russell, in terms of their ability to pause. Let's pull up the Russell and EMD charts, and you'll see what I'm talking about. Does everybody understand this? Everybody see that? So what I'm trying to say is that if, you're, if, you, if you've ruled NASDAQ out and you're not looking at it anymore, you're looking for movement, uh, you don't want to fall asleep. You want to see the markets move. So these are alternatives for you. Let's take a look at EMD real quick. Here's the open at 630. Of course, very similar to the other markets. Here's the European session. It was selling off all night, right? Got a little bit of consolidation chop. It looks it looks like the lot like the Weimer chart. It looks almost exactly like the Weimer chart, doesn't it? See, you got a little box here, came up, tried to continue the up move off the uh, mid band here. 638, 637. This is almost exactly like Weimer, isn't it? See it? Came up, rolled over, came up, rolled over, rolled over, start heading down. 
Get a continuation. You got several nice mid-band rolls on EMD here. See them? See all these little mid-band rolls? Those are all short trades for you right there. You can put EMD right next to Weimer. They're almost identical to each other, although this one's $10 a tick. Now, here's a word about EMD is sometimes the liquidity is low, and sometimes there's more of a spread. You might pay, you might pay an extra tick in slippage. Okay, so you just get a heads up. I would strongly urge you if you're going to start looking at EMD to trade it in SIM for a while. We used to have it in the room. Anybody remember that, the old days? Um, yeah, we used to have EMD, EMD in the room, and I think the Russell replaced it, as I recall. Here's 7 o'clock. Here's the news. Not too whippy. Here's 7, uh, seven o'clock's right here. Here's 7.02. Look, you got like three bars at the news on EMD. Very, very minimal algo trading here. Moves a lot slower. Let's go over and take a look at ES real quick. Some people don't like ES because it's too slow, and, and it's not enough um, volatility for them. They want more movement. So here's what I'm saying is that if you've got screen space for two or three charts, you know, you could work these other instruments into your mix, right? So maybe you start off with YM. Maybe you work in ES. Maybe you work in the Russell. Maybe you work in EMD. Like I said, keep, keep, maybe keep a gold chart kind of tucked on another screen. Just keep an eye on it. Let me contrast all those other markets with ES. Check this out. Here's midnight on ES. Uh, the European market right here. <laughs> you want a creeper. This is a creeper. Here's 630 right here. Let me open it up. In fact, i got to open it up just to show more bars. So at 6 o'clock, it's 6 a.m. Pacific. Well, right around the open, you had a mid t textbook mid-band box here, rollover. See, you were in a nice downtrend. It came back up and kissed the mid-band. In fact, somebody typed that in here. Is that you, Mark? Right around the open, the mid-band box short on ES? Yeah, right here. Look. Yeah, that was you. Yeah, good call. Good call. Yeah. So here you're, you're in a downtrend. You get a little bit of a double bottom on ES here at the swing. 24.16. Takes its good old time, sort of creeps back up to the mid-band. Sat here for about five minutes. <laughs> you, had plenty, you had plenty of time to think about it. Could have put a market short on there. Could have thrown a little box around it. Let, here, let me just let me just let's take, let's take a look and see how long it just sat here. It just sat on the mid band. It started sitting on the mid band around six, and it didn't break down until six thirty eight. Half an hour. Is that enough time to draw a box and thinking about shorting it? <laughs> yeah, it's about thirty eight minutes sitting up here. All right. So here, let, let's put that back in perspective. How many NASDAQ bars do we get in eight minutes? Like 150? Here's how many you got in 38 minutes on ES. <laughs> you could probably count them. That's 38 minutes. So it's a creeper. Yeah, you could have gone to get coffee. You could have gone down and scrambled up some eggs and some bacon, put a pot of coffee, but it came back up, and it'd still be sitting there. <laughs> you, you see why I have my volatility index from low to high, right? ES is a slow creeper, okay? If you like slow instruments and you really like slow, and it doesn't move very fast. It doesn't move a lot. Like here. Here's the whole day. Let me, let me just let, let, let's, let's finish this out, and then we'll go back to another chart. Here's your short setup at 638. It finally broke down, and then it took all the way till over here to get to the bottom, 710. So that's a half an hour. This one trade, this short, was a half an hour. Right here. So you're just watching it. You know, you're watching it. You, you, you can put... Now, here's the other thing about this. There's incredible volume on ES. You could throw a 100 lot at ES and it'd gobble it up. Nom, 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 like it wasn't even there. 500 lot. No problem. 1,000 lot. Here, let me put this in perspective. So everybody's clear about what I'm talking about here. I don't know if I'm going to have it. Uh, it's probably closed. Uh, I, can't, I don't know if I can do it that way. 
I might be able to stand by it. Let me let me drag this over. If I can't get the volume up here, I'll do it another way. Okay, here's the CME site. Everybody knows CMEgroup.com is the go-to site for futures. Here's ES down here. Well, you can even see it in the after hours that it's it's ten times the volume of everything else. Here's ES right here. Here's NASDAQ, and then here's the other ones right here. Okay, here's EMD down here, 109 contracts. So the volume is very low. Okay, no question on EMD, but you still get good movement out of it. It's not unusual to see the ES by the end of the day have a million and a half contracts traded. A million and a half. By far, there's nothing even close. The only other thing that even gets close to it is the bonds and the notes over here. See here, look, the notes, the uh, ZF, this is the five-year note, 14,000. Here's your 10-year notes, 26,000 lot. And the bonds down here, here's 4,000. These will be a half a million at the end of the day, half a million contracts. That's why I'm saying you can throw a 1,000 lot at it, and it'll just gobble it up. Nom, 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 like it's not even there. Here, uh, here's another way I want to show it. I'm going to show you a couple of vol volume bars, just so you can understand the volume that I'm talking about here. So what, what I'm trying to say is this, is that it is possible for you to develop very good skill sets in the patience of trading a slow instrument like ES, and then you can really leverage up on it. If you have, a, if you have the, as you build your capital and your trading account, and you got the size, you can throw as many contracts as you want at, at ES. Let me put some volume bars to show you what I'm talking about real quick. There are huge, there's so many institutional programs running against ES, it's just unbelievable. Thousands, okay, just, just to put it, just to let you know, thousands, thousands of scripts running. Here, let me show you something here. I'm going to do a volume up down bar in here just to show you. Thousands of scripts running. And they're each taking out a tick or two. Now you might say to yourself, "Well, how does anybody, how does they make money at ma making a tick at 12.50? How do they make any money?" Well, they they don't have any trading costs. All the big boys provide liquidity to the market, so their trading costs is nothing. They don't pay commissions like we do. So a tick is, you know, a tick on on 10,000 lot is huge. Let me show you real quick. Here you go. And you can see the bars pick up on the volume. Can everybody see the volume on ES here? Here, let's just pick one. Here's the open. Here's 630. Here's 631. Here's 630. One minute into the open, this bar right here. 13,000 contracts on that bar. This bar right there, 13,000 contracts just on that bar. Here's another one right here. You started selling off right here. Here was your sell-off. See the sell-off? This bar here was uh, 14, 000, almost 15,000 contracts, 30,000 contracts on those two bars. By the way, here's a separate little thing. I'm not going to uh, – our scripts are, are changing the color, Eddie. This is our scripts. This is our bar color scripts. I'm not going to get too much into this. Um, it's a separate thing that's outside of what we teach, but – I'm going to ask a question, see if anybody anybody knows and uh, notices anything. What in particular do you notice looking at this chart? And I'm going to get off of it because I want to show some other stuff. Right in this area right here, is there anything that sort of jumps out at you? Is anybody? I'm just lobbing this out for the team, just an open question. What's, a, what's different about the chart right in here? I'll give you a hint. Right in here, this area I'm circling with my little cursor. What's going on in here? Anybody? What is, what's going on in here? Anybody? Here, I'll help you out even more. What is that? Well, we talked about this before. We have a, what's called accumulation and distribution. Accumul accumulation and distribution. What does that mean? Well, all these people over here were getting short, right? Everybody over here was accumulating. That's what this is. Accumulation is, is where they're accumulating. They're getting short. The market is heavily short ES 
right in here. Heavy shorting, and you're shorting with them, right? We're shorting the roll off the mid band. We're the little guppy. We're the big, big whales out there, 15,000 contracts, and we're a little guppy swimming around with a couple of five lot, right? You're the guppy. You want to get in the stream. At some point, all these shorties got to start doing what? Covering those contracts and buying them back. What do you think this is right here? What do you think this is? That's right. They're buying it all back. They're shorting over here just like we would have if we were trading it, right? And they're buying it back right here. This is exhaustion. When you get a, when you get a final push down on a market in a given direction, that's called exhaustion. It's gone as far as it's going to go. In other words, there are no more people taking the short side of this trade right here. You can see it, it got a double bottom right here and started to head back up. You see the bar flip back up? See it? See all this covering? Everybody's buying it back. There's no more sellers down here. And then it tries to take one more. See, then you get some more accumulation right here. See it roll over? Didn't quite get to the mid band. The sellers are trying to step back in right here. See them? Can they get it back to the bottom, though? No. No follow through. Scripts and the programs and the sellers couldn't follow through here. And then what happens over here? Is this still selling going on over here, or has something changed? Is this still selling going on, or has something changed here? Hmm? This is eight o'clock in the morning, by the way. We're just getting ready, just getting ready to close the room. Buying is kicking in, right? Right, exactly. Buyers are stepping in. Buy programs are stepping in, right? Here's the shorties. We got the short. We all see it. Accumulation, distribution. They're making money. Now they got to buy it back. Here's the heavy buying to cover. They try to take one more shot at it. They try to push it down. The sell programs kick in, but they can't do it. More buying kicks in. Buying program kicks in. How do we know? Huge volume to the upside. Pushes right back through up to the mid band. Gives you a, ch a, ch a secondary chance to get in if you miss the box right here. Just under the mid band was a place to look to get long right here. Now I'm going to ask a question. At this point in time, why would you be looking to get long in this box and not short? I'm almost out of time. Anybody? I mean, technically speaking, as it formed, you could let that box go either way, although you're at 8 o'clock. What was the breadcrumb clues that were telling us that the likelihood of this market was probably going to be ES was heading up? What was the breadcrumb clues that had been left for us when we came to this box at 8 o'clock, eight, technically 8.15, 8 8.20? actually sat in that box for about five minutes. I'm telling you, ES is a slow grinder, so you got plenty of time to think about what you're going to do. Arguably, that box started to set up around 8.10, 8.15, 8.13, and it didn't start breaking up until over here around 8.20. I mean, you had 15 minutes it sat here. 15 minutes. Is that enough time to think about what you're going to do and draw a box? That's right, everybody. Higher highs and higher lows. By the time you reached over here, we had, I'm not going to circle them all, okay, but here was a low, here's a high. Here's a low, a higher low, yes. Here's a slightly higher high, higher low, higher high, higher low. By the time you got over here, you had one, two, three, four, five, arguably six higher highs and higher lows. You were starting to go in a little bit of an upward trend, upward sort of trending channel here, yes? So you're looking to buy. Market's not heading down. That's, that's seller exhaustion. Buy programs are now kicking in, of course, and they push the market higher. See it? Had another mid-band kiss right here. This was later in the morning. That was about 9.30. Little mid-band kiss right here. Nice textbook bounce. Put this in perspective. How long did you have to think about that little mid-band bounce? Well, it started to set up around 8 or 9.28-ish, 9.25, and it didn't bounce until over here at 9.43, 10 minutes. If you want a slower instrument and you want plenty of time to think about what you're going to do, you might want to take a look at ES. 
if ES is too slow for you, if you're falling asleep while you're drawing these boxes and your head hits the table, then it's too slow for you. The next one up, as I mentioned earlier, is go ahead and take a look at YM. It's a little bit faster. It's not near as fast as the Russell and, and NASDAQ, and there's still plenty of time to draw these boxes and take these trades. There's still plenty of time to draw them. Here, let's, let's, let's take a look at what YME was doing at that same time. Here's it coming up. It's coming up to the mid-band. It's poking its head through it at 653, right up in here, and it doesn't roll over until 654, 655. It sat up here for a minute or two. So you can see it's considerably less than ES. ES, I think, sat there for, I've, you know, what was it, 10 minutes? Here you're going to get a minute or two to put a box on it, or draw a ray, or draw a line, or do something to take your to take the trade here. You know, market order, uh, uh, limit order, by hook or by crook, you're getting short here on these rollovers, right? You can see over here at 7, 7.30, here's the news. Started to trade, change trend directions a little bit, went into this consolidation patch here. I stopped out of the short down here somewhere. I can't remember. Maybe I just want to hit this mid-band. And then started trading in a range. I called out this range in the room. I, didn't, I don't think I traded it. I might have taken one of these bounces, but I don't think I took the rest of them. So we can see here, I'm going to, I'm going to just contrast the two areas on this, and then we're going to get ready to wrap here. Um, here we can see that we were in a trending market right after the open. The, mar the trend in the Asian session or the European session was up. Equity market opens. We come. It tries to it it tries to take one last valiant shot at the top. Can't do it. Runs out of gas. Rolls over. We get the short. Get a beautiful short. That it could have been one and done. You put some contracts on that. That was one. That first 15 minutes. That could have been your one and done on Weimar. Right there, the short right here. Okay, you missed it, no problem. We get a mid-band retrace, perfect roll, plenty of time to get it. Called it in the room, bam, there you go. Right back to the mid-band, very respects it, rolls over perfectly, called it in the room, bam. Three beautiful short trades. By 7 o'clock when the news came out, you put a couple of three, four, five contracts on Weimar, you would have been done. Even with a two lot. Even with a two lot, you, you could have been up easily 500 bucks, easily. And then we go into the chop, and you don't have to trade the chop. And then we go a little bit into an uptrend here, right at 8 o'clock. You can see it was starting to consolidate, consolidate, consolidate. One last bounce off the mid-band. I think we called this. Textbook, beautiful box. Tight little box right at the mid-band. And then right going into 8 o'clock, you had that, that move right there. I mean, even if you avoided this chop and took nothing in here, you still got four beautiful trades out of it. Three shorts and a long while the room was open on Wyme. In that same, t same time, NASDAQ probably had 60 trades. <laughs> well, you want to, <coughs> excuse me, getting back to Dee's question about boxes, and then we're going to wrap. Let me just, let me just, uh, I know the title was Good, Bad, and the Ugly, and, and I should have spent more time talking about the boxes themselves. I'll take a few minutes right now to talk about box construction uh, and what is good, what's bad, and what's what, what's not so good. I got more distracted on trying to help people with look everybody in here and listening to the recording at looking at other instruments and considering other things if you're trying to find instruments to trade. Uh, D, to answer your question, a lot of it has to do with the size. And generally speaking, you're going to want it to be under 10 ticks. Here, for instance, the support was at the mid-band at 14, and the top of the box was at 21, you know, arguably 22. Now, here's what I like to do, okay? Here, here this would be a beautiful textbook picture of a, of a very, very nice box. Now, you have to be careful, okay? Can you see to the left here, you have wicks and, and bodies of candles, when I see a candle, I want to see normally at least two to four bars form. And then you want to engulf the wicks of the candles. In my view, a box like this would be too tight. Simply because one of these could close above it. In this case, you got a beautiful long trade. Okay, there was follow through the upside, so the wick of this candle didn't hurt you. 
Many, many times a box this tight is too tight. If you're down around four, five, six ticks and you only have a candle or two, it's usually, it, you, well, there are some exceptions to that. You can actually do that. In this case, it worked out. It was beautiful. And even if you did get in on a wick of this, or the close of that candle, your stop would be very tight right here. So you're only risking about six ticks. For me personally, I, I go back. I'm looking at these bars form. I go back. I look at the at the furthest candle back that it, right here. This candle right here is what I look at. Right here, this one. See it? You want to engulf the wick of that candle right there, and then you want the bottom of your box to be where the support level is, and then you engage it. In this case here, it was sideways to up. We could see that we wanted long only here. The, part, the other reason you don't want it long only is because it's quite possible that a bar could close down here, check the support level, you'd be getting, you'd be sucked in a short on a head fake, and then it blast in your face. So bias to the upside only on this box right here. I would say generally 10, less than 10 to 12 ticks, and it should be somewhere close to the mid-band. Um, there are boxes that are away from the mid-band that are perfectly acceptable. If it's in a trend and you get a shallow retracement, it's acceptable to box it in the direction of the trend. No question about it. But you want to see it usually under, under 10 or 12 ticks. If you get a box that's up pushing like 13, 15 ticks, let me see if I can find a big box for you. Let me see if I can find it. And listen, if you can't, look, if you, if you have trouble drawing the region box, and I'm seeing some comments here, I'm, I have, you know, uh, trouble drawing the region box, it, it's this simple. You can take and you can put limit orders here, right? You would put a limit order here. You would just put a limit order right there for one or two lot or whatever. You just, you could do a market buy. There's all manner of ways to get in trades, right? You put a limit order right here. I don't know why this is not taking my line. A limit buy order right here, right above where the box would be. See the candles? You'd be filled on that candle right there, just like the box. You know, if you're struggling with that, that's a, that's kind of a workaround for you until you can get the region box thing kind of worked out. I would continue to work on the region box. It's, it's a little bit more superior than trying to put limit orders around, um, mainly because it'll put the targets and stops and manage the trade for you in a semi-automated manner. Whereas with just a straight up limit order, now you got to put your targets and stops and follow the whole thing on your own manually. 737. How would you box 737? I don't know where 737. Where's 737? Right here. <coughs> Excuse me. How do we trade? How do we trade this range? That's a bigger. That's the bigger question, Richard. That's the bigger question. How would you trade this range? Because by the time you got to 737, you already knew you were in a range, right? We already knew we were in a range. So how are we trading this range? Notwithstanding the box, just put the box aside for a second. Just, 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 just put a pause on the bo the region box just for a second because there's there's it's it's different approaches i guess that's what i'm trying to say let me get back over here in the case of the trending move when the trend was down we are looking for entries at or around the mid band on retracements very appropriate to use a ray or a region box to get in when you come over here in this space over here are we still trending Are we still trending? Well, let me ask a bigger question because this begs the bigger question. Do we trade a range the same way that we trade a trend? Yes or no? That's a yes or no question. It's a yes or no. It, there's not, I don't know. Of course, you could say I don't know. Here is a range. Here is a trend. Here is the trend. Here's a range. Here's the trend. Do we trade them both the same? Do we trade a trend the same we trade a range? Do we, or is it the same approach? Or are ranges traded differently than trends? 
What say you, team? Are they the same, yes or no? Good. No. No, they're definitely not the same. No, they are different. In a range, we try our best to find support and resistance areas, and then we have to determine our primary mode of entry. Is it going to be shorting the top of it and covering at the bottom? Is our primary mode of entry buying at support, taking profit at the top? Is the, tr is the range large enough to trade is our first question. And what's our minimum? What's our minimum size for a tradable range? Anybody? I've said this a thousand times in the past nine years. What's the minimum? 20 to 25 ticks. So let's take a quick gander at this one. Here you got support around the mid-band-ish. And you got resistance up here at, you know, 25, 28. What is that? 14 ticks? 16 ticks, maybe? Just slightly less than 20. This would be the borderline of the lowest degree of almost borderline not tradable. Because here's why. In order to get in, you would be buying support. And you have to fade support. So when you fade support by four or five ticks and you say support is at, say, 11 to 14, then you're actually trying to buy it right here. Right? And then you're trying to get out of it before it hits resistance. So you're trying to fade the top to get out. And so you're trying to get out here. So by the time, by the time you get filled and you get some slippage and pay some commission, is there enough meat on the bone to make any money in this range? What do you think? Is there any meat on the bone there? I don't know. Maybe there's six ticks. We could take a look at it. I mean, by the time you get in and out, pay some commission, you know, you're getting filled around 15, 16-ish. You're trying to get out here by 23. That's seven ticks. You going to buy and sell all day in here? Probably not. That's why I didn't trade in here. Anybody remember? I went silent on Weimar. I just said, hey, it's in a range between about 13 and 28. Remember? I didn't, I didn't call anything in here. I didn't take anything in here. There's no meat on the bone in here. I mean, you can, you listen, you can scalp it if you want. The only problem is this, is that in this particular case, your primary mode of entry was probably going to want to be buying support, taking profit at the top. Because eventually it did break out. So if you were shorting the top, then you got stopped out on that last one. So you had a you had a long trade here, arguably a short here, long trade here, short up here, long trade here, and then eventually that one took off. <coughs> Excuse me. If you trade both sides of a range, so in a range you're buying support and you're you're selling the top and buying support, or you're buying the top bottom and taking profits at the top, or you're shorting the top and taking short covering at the bottom or you trade both sides. If you trade both sides, normally your last trade can be a loser. So for instance, let's say that you wanted to, you were looking to get short up here again. Obviously that trade didn't work out, although if you threw a box on it, it didn't fill you. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll go ahead and throw a volume indicator on here real quick for you. I don't want anybody to get too distracted with the volume thing. Um, I just threw it up there to show any, uh, we don't really use that as, a, as any we don't make any trade decisions off of it. I mean, if you want to glance at it, as long as you don't just get distracted by it, I really wouldn't use it for trade decisions, just as a heads up. But if you want to see contrast the volume of Weimar versus uh, those ES trades, yeah. Let's see what kind of volume you got on Wyoming. Okay, let me, let me take some guesses. What were the numbers on ES? Anybody remember? Right around the open? What were those numbers on ES? Anybody remember the volume we had on ES? The volume spikes? Remember what they were? If 13,000, 15,000, 14,000, right? Okay, take a guess. Before I show this, take a guess what you think Weimer is. Just type in a number. We're going to wrap after this. We're getting long in the tooth. Go ahead, just type some numbers in. What do you think that same volume bars are on, on old Wyoming? Go ahead, just take a wild guess. Just type, just type in a number, just for the heck of it. Cast your vote. What do you, what do you think old Wyoming's going in at? Ten thousand, five thousand, a thousand a bar. What do you think? 
Ooh, we got some big numbers here. 600. We got Lee. We got Peter saying 1,000, 1,500. Ooh, we got some low ones too. D coming in at 250. Lauren saying 200. Carl saying 300. Okay, you ready? Here we go. There's the volume on Wyoming. Ouch! Where's the volume? Where's the beef? Anybody remember that commercial, that, that old lady? Where's the beef? Here, let's take a big one. Here's a big one right here. Ooh, 500. Look at these little tiny bars. Look at this one right here. That's, a, that's 38 contracts on that bar right there. Do you think that there's big computer algorithms running from the big boys in here? What do you think? Or is this more discretionary traders like us? What do you think looking at this chart based on these volume numbers that you're looking at here? Could you throw 500 lot at Weimer and not get any slippage? Could you throw 100 lot at it? What do you think? You're going to put 200 lot on here? I don't think so. No, there's no big boys in here. This is this is uh, you, you probably have a couple little rogue scripts running against it, but I, I, this is not the big boys. There's just no volume here. There's not enough movement to make any money. <clears throat> yeah, a hundred lot, and you're making the market. Yeah, you're pushing the market around with a hundred lot. You're gonna get a ton of slippage. By the time you get filled, you probably wish you didn't get filled. All right. Anyway, let me uh, let me stop the recorder. Thanks for coming.